Going uh, from roommates uh, right, to house. Right, right. Like, okay. <laughs> well, my first condo was a little... We call the February 4th, 2013 San Carlos Planning Commission to order. Uh, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Commissioner Corral. Present. Excuse me. Let me do that one more time. The microphone was off. Commissioner Corral. Present. Commissioner Gutierrez. Present. Commissioner Silberman. Present. And Vice Chair Harper Pedersen. Present. And Chair Bast Marsters. Present. Thank you. Um, public comment. Um, public comment is a time for anybody in the audience who is interested in talking about anything that is not on the agenda. Good evening, Honorable Chair, members of the Commission. Uh, I'd like to make an introduction this evening uh, with the departure of Planning Manager, Retirement of Planning Manager Deborah Nelson. The city's made an important new hire, and I'd like to introduce Lisa Porras, who just did the roll call. And she's our new principal planner who will be taking over for Miss Nelson. And uh, uh, Lisa comes to us from Benicia, where she was the senior planner for many years. And she also worked for the city of Ventura for many years as well. She brings a wealth of experience, both in current and in long range planning. And uh, we're very pleased uh, to have her here. She will be taking over uh, in similar role as Ms. Nelson. She'll be the secretary to the Planning Commission. And so uh, we look forward to working with the commission uh, in the coming months and years. Great. Welcome. 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 Um, next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. Are there, has everybody read the minutes? Are there any changes? I'm going to move approval. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Um, the next item tonight is new business. 959 Skyway Road, <coughs> APN 0460817880. Architectural review of a freeway-oriented sign totaling 42.7 square feet in area. For the building at 959 Skyway Road. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. My name is Gavin Monahan, and I was the planner assigned to 959 Skyway Road. I will be taking you through the application tonight. This is for a request for freeway oriented signage. It, it falls under the architectural review, which is under the purview of the Planning Commission for any sign that's viewable from US 101 or for parcels that are within 100 feet of the highway. The project location is located in the south end of the city. Um, on the right hand side of 101 in this picture, the, there are two buildings there that are uh, the Skyway buildings. The building uh, highlighted with the red star is the building that's receiving the new wall sign. There are, it's a multi-tenant building. There are already three highway-oriented wall signs in the complex, and this will be the fourth. The site size is approximately 12 and a half acres. It's one of the Santa Carlos's larger parcels. This is one of our larger developments. Um, and it's governed under a PD zoning, uh, specifically Ordinance 1232. And this governed uh, most specific, more specifically the design and build of the building, how tall it is and uh, how many floors and how the square footage and whatnot. Um, inside that ordinance also were uh, maximum allowances for signs. There's also a section for a sign program that's built into the ordinance, which allows up to 600 square feet of signage. The general plan is planned industrial and the existing use is multi-tenants. There's a variety of different uh, professional and Silicon Valley clean tech types of businesses in the in the two buildings. The request is to install one new wall-mounted sign 
it's approximately 42.7 square feet of signage. Um, and the existing monument and directional signs on the campus, on the, uh, the property of the two buildings, will remain in place. The three existing signs, if you've been by to see them, are actually quite small uh, for freeway-oriented signage. They fit in the building nicely. They fit on the, on the uh, extra space above the third floor where the fenestration ends on the third floor. Uh, and this will cap, this will be the fourth location for a new tenant. So currently there are signs for George P. Johnson, Mark Logic, and Wells Fargo. Uh, and this will be a uh, fourth tenant in the building. Uh, the municipal code does require the planning commission to grant architectural review. And that is why it's in front of you tonight. The new tenant is Checkpoint Software Technologies. It takes a second to load this one slide. And this is a visual representation of the proposed signage on secured to the building. I included this slide kind of as a zoom out just to get an idea of the proportions of it. And this is their graphic and logo and their proposed signage. The Planning Commission must make architectural review findings, there are four of them, um, in order to grant approval for the uh, proposed wall sign. Uh, the proposal as, a, as proposed tonight is consistent with the requirements of Title 18, um, specifically our sign ordinance, and it's, they're also, it's also in keeping um, and meeting a variety of general plan policies and objectives as discussed in the staff report. Staff is recommending that the Planning Commission approve the request of Joseph DiCioso for architectural review approval of a new 42.7 square foot wall mounted sign for Checkpoint software. I have a formal motion that I will leave on the, as a slide, uh, should you choose to uh, vote and approve this request tonight. And I'm available for questions as is the applicant. Would the applicant like to say anything? Okay. Um discussion from the Commission I just have a, um, a question about the illumination um, are any of the other existing signs over there illuminated okay that's what I thought I drove by during the day so I wasn't sure have there been any problems or complaints with um, light spillage from any of the other signs staff has not received any complaints for this complex um, and I would also mention that their maximum signage is 600 square feet and um, with this approval, should you approve it tonight, there would be at about 350. So they're about 58% of their maximum um, allowed signage underneath the ordinance. So on, they're on the low side of the sign. We typically see applicants come in on the high side at the maximum. Uh, that's the common request. But in this case, they're um, asking for less. Thank you. Any further discussion? Would someone like to make a motion? I move that the Planning Commission approve the request of Joseph S. DiCioso representing corporate sign systems for the approval of a 42.7 square feet of wall mounted signage for 959 Skyway Road, San Carlos, based on the findings and for the reasons incorporated in the staff report. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 There is a 10 day right of appeal, so as soon as that passes. Um, we move on to the public hearing. The procedure for the public hearing, staff will present a report on the history, physical features, etc., of the application, followed by the staff's recommendations. The applicant will make a presentation. Thereafter, interested members of the community may speak on the proposal. When all interested parties have had an opportunity to be heard, the hearing will be closed and no further discussion from the floor can be held. The Commission will then consider the evidence and make its recommendation. If you challenge a public hearing item in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at the public hearing described in this notice, the public notice, or in written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. Speakers should fill out a speaker's form found by the door and hand it to the recording secretary prior to addressing the Commission. The speaker should come up to the microphone to speak <coughs> since the meeting is being recorded. This will assist, assist staff in preparing the minutes. The item, first item, the only item, is 639 Quarry Road, APN 046040370, consideration of a request 
for approval of a conditional use permit for pronounce that for me will you Omalaga Omalaga incorporated day program thank you Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Gavin Monahan, and I'm also reviewing um, the request for conditional use permit for 639 Quarry Road for an adult day program. This requires conditional use permit approval from the Planning Commission. The request entitlement um, of a CUP uh, is a requirement under the Municipal Code. Um, in this case, it is uh, under 1807.02 of the zoning ordinance requires review and approval for this type of use. Uh, colleges and trade schools, both public and private, can be conditionally approved in the zoning district uh, with the review and approval by the Planning Commission. The subject site is an industrial area at south of Quarry Road between Industrial and Old County Road. Uh, the project site is approximately 17,000 square feet about a third of an acre, uh, and it has a little over 9,000 square foot existing building on the site. The proposal is to use 7,200 square feet of the front of the building for the day program. The building is uh, on the right-hand side there, highlighted with the black box. It has surface parking both in the front and available space for surface, park surface parking along the side, uh, most likely striped diagonal for easy access. Um, the past tenant, uh, it's currently a vacant building, but the t past tenant was Vertex Marble and Tile. <clears throat> the applicants are requesting a change of use from its existing, uh, from its previous use uh, to a trade <coughs> school via the CUP process. Um, the school would be, and I, I'm, I have the applicant here tonight, and I'll have him go over some of the details of the, the, their training and uh, adult skills program. Uh, it's for um, adults with development, dis developmental disabilities. Um, their definition of adults, as is ours, is over 18. Um, and they will be learning a variety of life skills that was detailed in the staff report, um, from balancing checkbooks to social skills to um, information on available availabilities of other services within the community that they can go and seek out with some training, kind of help them to help themselves. Um, and everything from leisure activities to uh, home-based skills would be taught there. The hours of operation, uh, in the applicant's description, if you went through his pages, he has lesser hours. And I went ahead and did what we recommend, uh, what Chair Marsters often recommends, is ask the applicant what is the actual breadth of hours that you would like. They tend, applicants tend to come in with a very narrow focus of what they're doing this month or next month and not possibly six months or a year from now. So that's the discrepancy between his description and the staff report. But um, hours of eight to six are reasonable. That would be the time that they would be in there unlocking and getting programs set up. Staff would be. Um, present at the facility, and then their uh, their students would be, most of them would be there between 9.30 in the morning to 3.30 in the afternoon. So a much shorter period compared to what their overall hours of operations are. The interior space will be as assigned to various uses, including the staff offices, bathrooms, hallway space, and then the activity area. There's uh, quite a simple site plan. Sometimes you'll see site plans that have been prepared by architectural firms. Um, and in this case, the applicant wanted to get his uh, entitlement uh, prior to going down the road of having structural plans drawn for the building and uh, all the TI work that's required for the change of occupancy. Those specific requirements are outlined in this, the draft conditional use permit, and they include comments from uh, public works, from the fire department, and also from the building division. So those are comments, um, and those are things that they would need to address prior to actually occupying the building. So their interest at this point is to getting um, some commitment so they can sign a lease and move forward with that and some of the more expensive building upgrades that would need to be done. That explains the site plan here. They have a basic site plan. Gavin? Yes. Will they need to come back to us with the specific site no, plan? No, not, not unless... Go through the building department. Yeah, not unless something um, significant about their use changed through the review. But in this case, you're just approving the use of this type of adult day program. And then how they get into the building, whether there's this fire sprinkler requirements, egress requirements, all of those types of things, um, bathrooms, ADA bathrooms, access, parking, those we hash out mostly in the building through the building division, but also through fire and public works. So those will be, work, those will be done at the, at the um, building permit issuance level. And they will need to conform with what you approved tonight. So the square footage won't change. It won't go from 72 up to 9,000 something. 
Um, it won't increase, but it would be based on something that you approve, the type of use, and for the general program, square footage, number of <coughs> occupants, uh, description of the program, hours of operation, those things would all need to be maintained to what is approved here tonight. And before you move away from this diagram, I actually had a question. So I noticed there's two exits um, to, on the right-hand side of the building, mm -hmm. and they look like they're sort of in park into parking spaces. I assume those spaces will actually be striped so that there's no parking in those spaces? Those will need to be jogged outside of the exit path. Um, and there's a couple of different exit path widths depending on the cl use classification through the building division of the, um, but typically one of them is 44 inches. So in the case of one of the doors, the parking will be offset by 44 inches um, on the site plan here, uh, be spread out so that there's the clearance for exit where the parking is. Yeah, that's a requirement. And these, again, these were plans that were drawn up with a combination of the real estate listing and the applicant uh, working with staff to get some minimum information on the plans. When they come in for building permits, the building division will require them to have structural calculations, plans drawn by an architect because of the use, um, clear exit paths, uh, significant more specificity than we look at it in planning. So. So one of the things a little bit to talk about here is their use. So they have a program uh, of adult training. They also work with the Golden Gate Reg Regional Center. So they take clients from them or they take students from them on a referral basis. So this, this request actually has also some business services um, similarities that we find in our zoning code. Uh, and of course the office use is an allowed use, but the adult day program is the part that we're having you look at today being similar to a trade school. Because of their uh, client base, the students with adults with disabilities, I understand that none of them would drive to the location. So our zoning codes parking requires, um, let me go to the parking and talk a little about that. The parking requirement straight out of the table requires one space for a census of three. So students of two, staff of one require one space. In this case, they're asking to have up to 15 staff and 30 students for a total census in the building of 45, requiring a total technical parking uh, requirement of 15 spaces. They've shown 16, so my first thought was the concern with the egress, but if they spread an eight-foot space out, they'll get egress pass for two, at least two of the doors using the extra space that's not necessarily required. Um, and it's probably um, overparked. This is the straight numbers out of the zoning code because we don't discuss what happens if we are, have a use that does, has no parking demand or lesser parking demand because of the type of occupancy. So in this case, the staff will be driving and parking, um, and the uh, the students will not. They also administer and uh, distribute SAMTRANS or parking passes. I don't know if they use the Clipper system um, or San Mateo only to encourage public transport for not only their staff, but they issue them for the students in the program. So there's also a, a reliance on public transportation, which would also decrease the the actual parking demand on site. Yeah, is there any bus service over there? I mean, if they get SamTrans passes, um, where is the closest location that they could walk from? Is it El Camino in Belmont, or is it El Camino in in uh, uh, San Carlos? I don't think there may be a stop um, over just near Longs that they could yeah. actually walk. Yeah, you can go through the cut through, through right? Cut through, and and that may be in from Longs East. Plaza back through onto Old County where the the dog care facility kind is. Of trying to figure out if yeah, the there isn't a lot of bus service on the, in the industrial side of town. Yeah, but uh, I think the understanding is that a lot of clients would probably also be driven, and I'm not sure if they're coming. From, I have that applicant here, so it would be interesting to ask him about that if they're coming from other facilities. Um, or if there's any type of uh, group or communal housing involved, they may commute together or in groups. Uh, but I know that the students are not, they are non-drivers. And the staff are also given trans, transit cards, and I th would think that they would be able to make the walk from Longs Plaza out to that location. Um, it's, it's on this side of Quarry Road, so it's, it's not a long walk through that, through that pedestrian tunnel on the north end of town. This is a picture of the building. This is the front elevation. This would be the entrance of the building. And it does have exist existing surface parking and an ADA accessible handicap spot there to the left of the address. 
And this is the side of the building that shows where there's additional available parking. What we typically see, and we haven't seen their building permit submittal package yet, but we typically see are um, oftentimes roll-up doors are left because you can open them in good weather, but oftentimes they don't meet Title 24, depending on the occupancy, so they're removed. And they'll put framing in and they'll stucco over the openings or they'll put in just a regular pedestrian door in their place. Obviously, they're not going to be receiving large shipments for this type of use, so those doors will not need to function. Parking in front of them we've allowed in the past. Uh, planning has allowed parking in front of the roll-up doors when they're not um, germane to transit. They're not required to get cars in and out. They're just there for the availability of, of making deliveries. Um, and with several businesses in town, they're not open maybe once a month, so it doesn't really impact the parking. And again, this is the calculations for the technical parking requirement. There are six conditional use permit findings that need to be made by the Planning Commission in order to approve the request for a CUP tonight. They are uh, listed out in the staff report. Staff was able to um, make um, the findings in the staff report and also find sections of the general plan as reference supporting the proposed use of this type of facility on in the industrial area. Staff's recommendation was for approval um, for a day facility for Matthew Omolaga at 639 Quarry Road. I do have a formal motion that I can leave up should the Planning Commission decide to, uh, to vote in favor of this conditional use permit tonight. And I'm available for additional questions if you have them. And the applicant is here and other representatives of his firm. Yeah. Go ahead. I've got some. <laughs> um, so when the applicant does come back with a signage, because they'll obviously want to, would that just go through, go to the planning department? That wouldn't come back to us, most likely. Yeah, this uh, sign request would be staff level, because it okay. doesn't trigger the, the, any of the freeway-oriented requirements for, for architectural review. And then, um, just to be clear, there wasn't a kitchenette or food prep on site listed, was no, there? No, none has been proposed. If they do on-site cooking, then they'll have to comply with the fire department's requirements for venting, okay. um, extinguishers, and clear exit paths. And would that come back to us if, if there was? Okay. Not, not unless the use changed. So for instance, okay. they changed to become a culinary school for right. disabled adults. And the hours are different. It's in the evening. And it, it appeal that if the use permit changed because of the a kitchen requirement, then you would okay. see it. If the kitchen's added in order to supply foods, uh, meals, for the students during the day right. or to teach um, basic cooking skills, right. then that would not be a significant change from what they're requesting tonight. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and my only other question was really about circulation and drop off, but that might be more appropriate for the applicant. Um, my thinking was also that there might not be students driving, but there would be a lot of drop off similar to um, maybe what we experience at the college when people come and drop off their students and I, I didn't know how that would affect traffic and circulation in that area. Is that enough space? I don't know. For That's a good question. So according to the diagram you have here, mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether you can go back to that, the essentially site map. There's an entryway on the right-hand side and an exit and entrance on the left. Would that be an appropriate way to get in and out? Yeah, there's, the there are two existing curb cuts, so they could okay. use the, the curb cut on the eastern side to enter and um, be out of the travel way of Quarry Road and then re-exit back on Quarry through the, other, the, 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 east, the western curb cut. But we are talking about 30 students all being dropped off around the same time in the morning, right? Yeah, their maximum census is 30, so my okay. understanding is that they may not have 30 at all times, sure. and the drop-off times would, knowing students, is likely to be staggered. Okay. The students do have individual programs, so it's not necessarily oh, like see. a class that starts at 930. They have tailored programs for their specific needs that are drawn out by a case manager, and so there would be some differentiation, um, not only in the times that they're there, probably, but what they're doing while they're there as well. well and, the, and there's street parking in front so they people aren't required to actually drive on to the property to drop people off either. that's correct you so. could pull over to the curb right so okay thank you those are my questions uh i had a i had a question about uh, the clients um, it says uh on the program design page 
client does not have a history of criminal assault. That seems kind of vague to me. Would, would you like to ask that of the applicant right. rather than staff? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, so let, let's bring the applicant oh, up. Okay. And, right. And you can ask the applicant okay. that question. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. My name's Matt O'Melaga, and I'm the, the, uh, the worst half of O'Melaga Inc. My wife and I run a company to support uh, persons, adults with developmental disabilities. We've been in the business now for approximately 12 years, funded through Golden Gate Regional Center, and work in other counties in Northern California. To address your question, we serve adults with developmental disabilities. Some individuals that we support um, have gotten trouble uh, due to their disability with the criminal justice system in the past. And part of what our program provides is the structure for people, a place to go to, productive programming during the day. And so we have an entrance criteria and we meet different people with developmental disabilities with many different backgrounds. Some have behavioral challenges, some have had other challenges with the criminal justice system. And they're all people with developmental disabilities and we serve them in a structured adult day program in context from around 9.30 to 3.30 every day to touch on some of the transportation issues. Some folks are dropped off as early as 8.30. Programming is staggered. Typically what happens is sometimes 15 individuals are in the community based and 15 are on site just to stagger the transportation and to make sure that we're not congested. But everybody has individual programming and again the goal is to serve 30 people with developmental disabilities. Do you operate another, I'm sorry, no, do just, you operate another facility um, similar in not size similar, and scope? Not similar to the day program. Okay. Uh, we, we do scattered site day program currently, which is where we meet an individual with developmental disabilities in their own home, take them out to the community and have programming in parks or, or different areas in a, in a community-based setting, but no site-based center. We do operate licensed residential care facility in Redwood City. Thank you. Sorry about that. It's okay. Um, I just uh, back to my original question. So, could you define your your baseline mm -hmm. of criminal assault? Um, we we work with individuals who have developmental disabilities who may have been involved in the criminal justice system at some point in their life. It could be something as simple as uh, someone may have. Um, got a jaywalking ticket, something as simple as that, and been tagged as an adult. Someone may have gotten to a fight at a school and is now sent to sort of a more structured program. Um, so criminal assault is not, a, is not a typical, not everybody in our program has a, a prior criminal assault on their record. Um, but there's a possibility that someone who has a criminal background could be in our program um, who is a developmental disabilities. Someone who is incompetent to stand trial um, and has been placed in a program to um, be required to participate in structured programming. So it, the wording here where it says client does not have a history of criminal assault, mm -hmm. is that criminal conviction? Sure. Well, or just <clears throat> because you, you, mentioned, you mentioned that uh, they may not have been uh, competent to stand trial. Sure. So they could have been accused, arrested, gone through the legal process, and then found not to be able to stand trial. So you, those, those are potential clients for your, your There's business. a possibility. You know, my, my goal with the report was to be transparent and try to be inclusive on any potential makeup of individual we could serve. Um, so there's a possibility that someone may have had a, a running with the criminal justice system maybe a prior assault charge. Um, incompetent to stand trial is now participating in a structured day program. Um, very similar to a couple um, locations, a couple, two buildings down, Peninsula Works does some um, job placement services for folks. Similar population, except our folks have developmental disabilities. Um, so lower functioning individuals. Okay. Any other questions? On from this side. 
we be I'm just looking something. I, I I was actually confused by that as well, because um, and now I'm actually more confused because this report says that your clients will not have a history of criminal assault, and it sounds like uh, you're saying that some of the clients do have a history of criminal assault. I was also confused because criminal assault is not like a there's no definition of criminal assault. Like if you had said in here, our clients don't ha haven't been convicted of a violent felony, mm -hmm. that would make sense, or arrested for a violent felony. So, um, but it sounds like you don't limit your client base based on criminal charges they may have had. We specifically, our company is a general company. We work with people with developmental disabilities who have had issues with. Uh, in the criminal justice system. Some have formal charges, some don't have formal charges, some people have don't have a, a history of criminal offense, but we would take, we would look at somebody who's had a second chance program. For example, if someone had run in and had been, uh, no one has been convicted of a, a criminal assault in our program, but there's a possibility. Like I said earlier, the goal is to be totally transparent that we, we would take someone with a developmental disability. I think that's sort of the key here, someone who's incompetent to stand trial, someone who needs structured programming, we would welcome them into the program from our programming perspective. So the report is, is incorrect? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have the document in front of me, okay. so, so I'm not sure exactly what line you're referring to, so it's, it's difficult for me to answer that specific question. That is incorrect. So to be so to be to be direct, that that could be a possibility. Someone could have a history. So that is incorrect. Okay. And would we need to correct that when we pass this motion, or is it just that that's sort of a um, statement of purpose from the applicant that isn't actually part of the application? So I think there's, so I, there's, I guess, two questions here. Should we correct it to his application materials or his dis business description should say that there is a possibility that some students or a student would not be denied because of a past criminal activity, including whatever the list that he would want to include. Um, because I don't think what, we, as a condition, we would ask that they have none of those people in the program. They may, that may not be a possibility based on how they get student referral from other countywide programs. I just want to make sure that it's accurate. Yes, absolutely. As much as possible. Yeah, we can reflect that for the record. Well, actually, that kind of segues into my next question. I was wondering whether we could um, condition the permit on um, them not having clients who have been convict convicted of a violent felony, because there's actually a definition of violent felony in the penal code. Mm -hmm. It's section 667.5 of the penal code. It includes things like murder and rape and, and that sort of thing. Um, if there were such a limitation, would that be problematic? For you? With the current client base, it wouldn't be problematic. But just to, to be transparent to the Planning Commission, I appreciate your time, is what we do from a mission perspective is we work with people who are developmentally disabled who have had a run-in with, uh, with, with the criminal justice system. Most folks have not been convicted because they have been found incompetent to stand trial. We currently are not serving someone who's been convicted of a violent uh, crime. But programmatically, from a mission perspective, that could happen. So there is a possibility one day something like this, somebody could walk into our doors who had done something 20 years ago. And I guess what you're proposing is potentially they wouldn't be allowed at this site. So some of your clients have been found incompetent to stand trial for violent felonies? Some, some of our clients have, yes. Concerning, yeah, a little bit. So, so theoretically, you could have someone 
who was found incompetent to stand trial for murder. Theoretically, but have ag you? Again, we're talking about two different things. We're talking about our company in general and in this site. What's what's scheduled for this site? Well, my my concern is the the people that will be no for there. this site. People who have been scheduled to go into this program have not been. So would you have an objection? No, I mean, if, if that's what the Planning Commission wants, we would we'll be, we'll be open to that. Oh, and then the second question would be, can we even make that kind of condition? That would be a question yeah, for staff. Right. Mr. Chairman, yes, you can make that condition. <clears throat> okay. Well, what that would simply do is we put that into our exit pro our, our program design as an entrance criteria. How would how would we define that? Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, just is, can we discuss this now? Uh, let's ask a few more questions, okay. and then when we have our discussion, when we close the public hearing, we can have that discussion. Okay. Okay. Um, so I have a couple of other questions here. Unless I that was actually my only question. Okay. So the first is: Is there any um, connection from the activity activity area here to the office area? Um, my concern is that you show no doorway between the two areas, mm -hmm. and if you actually have to go outside to go from the activity area to the office area, you're going to be walking everybody through these parking lots as as they need. So I want to make sure that as part of this, there's some internal connection um, to the uh, between the two areas. Yes, and actually, where you see the egress from the current proposed bathroom there is actually a connection there is a connection, there is a connection. It's just so the restrooms won't be there correct I see okay so the restrooms will be located somewhere else okay adjacent okay. to the door and then getting back to the question of Samtrans mm -hmm. um, it sounds like the closest one is probably over um, I, I think the stop is just inside the border of Belmont Right. Um, and that's and that's the intended pathway for for some. However, most folks, Planner Gavin is correct that most folks get dropped off at the front of the building. Okay. Considered Caltrain? Uh, no, uh, private transportation companies. But I mean for public transportation, other than Sam yeah. Trans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, because that would be a a good walk. Yes, very. Um, from Caltrain up. Okay, I had two other questions here. Um, so you, you talk in here about sort of recreational activities. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of some sort of recreational activity that will go on amongst this group? Sure. Um, beads, making jewelry out of beads, making T-shirts, uh, sports, playing basketball, table tennis. Uh, the idea of a day program is to provide recreational and vocational opportunities, a structured setting to keep individuals with developmental disabilities, um, giving them something to do, something productive. Some folks sell these in micro enterprise, uh, sell different products that they make. Some folks uh, just do it for purely recreational basis. So those are a few of the things that we would be doing. Thank you. Um, and the last question um, was I was trying to understand one of your exit criteria here. Mm -hmm. Has a change in restrictive health condition that may require additional training for B and L lead day program staff? And I was so, trying to figure out what B and L lead day program staff are. B and L leads um, a current provider in San Mateo County who's consulting on this project and they deal with people with behaviors, people with developmental disabilities who have different behaviors, um, have some behavioral challenges, and if their behavioral challenges exceed to the level that our current staff couldn't deal with, we would reassign them to another program like BNLE. Okay, so that would be an alternative for the um, uh, students that um, might not fit into the criteria that, that exactly. we've been concerned about up here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Um, 
Any other questions from the commission? Okay, I have uh, one request to speak um, from Chris. I'm, I'm going to let you come up and give us your name. Thank you. My name is Chris Ronier, and I am the Chief uh, Financial and Operating Officer of Golden Gate Regional Center. And I just thought I'd avail myself so you could uh, avail you, myself to you to answer questions about how this system works. Uh, we are a state-sponsored agency. There are 21 regional centers in the state of California that are geographically designated to, uh, to take care of the needs of developmentally disabled people. It's the only thing like it in the entire United States. We're the only state that has an actual statute, the Lanterman Act, that mandates that anybody who's deemed eligible before their 18th birthday will be served by the state of California. It is an entitlement act, which means regardless of the number of clients, the funding has to be there to take care of them. Golden Gate Regional Center is responsible for Marin, San Mateo, and San Francisco counties. I have about 8,500 clients in community-based uh, residential facilities or in their own homes with supplemental services, and about I think we're down to about 137 clients still in institutions, which I'm, my job is to get them out of those institutions, some of which you may have read about recently, like Sonoma Developmental Center and some of the things that are going on there. The, the regional centers are contracted with the state of California through the Department of Developmental Disabilities. My budget is about $200 million a year. Those funds come through us, and we then uh, contract with vendors, service providers, to provide services to our clients. Uh, the providers, uh, we have full social work staff. Social workers are assigned caseloads. Unfortunately, now they're up in the 80s where they're supposed to be in the 60s. Uh, the social workers work with family members, with the clients, to figure out what the combination is to meet their needs. The Landerman Act is very, very specific about the fact that you are to tailor um, the services to meet an individual client need, regardless of what those are. So someone's needs may come if for a, a common term would be in dollars. So someone may only need $1,000 worth of services a year. Another person may need $200,000 worth of services, depending on medical conditions, on, uh, on some of the criteria, cerebral palsy. Uh, you may have some severe uh, duly diagnosed people who, have, who are not only developmentally disabled, but who would have access one uh, mental health, which means they're mentally ill as well as developmentally. And some have both of those plus medical issues. Not fun. When you hear about autism, the big thing about autism nowadays, the, our agency is responsible for serving young autistic, well, it doesn't have to be young, but the autism tsunami that's starting to hit. <clears throat> so what we do is we contract with service providers. Our social workers uh, meet with a family in what we call an IPP, an individual placement plan. They sit down and they go through a menu, if you will, of services available to try to develop the potential of the DD person, whether they're six, uh, seven years old, 18 years old, whatever the age is. From that, the family work together, they develop this plan, and then they look at which vendors do we have in which communities that could serve those people, and what those services are, what the constellation is, and how we get them around. For example, the young man here tonight is talking about a day program. There are residential facilities. I happen to be very proud of this fact we've sponsored things from 24-hour nursing all the way through dementia, everything. No, no other regional center in the state of California has <coughs> the services that we have in this area. But to get from the home, uh, there are also transportation contracts, uh, contractors we have who bring, uh, who, who will bring the people from that residential home to the day program in groups usually of four or five. Sometimes it's the residential provider that has their own van. Sometimes it's a bigger van like you'll see on the freeway. You see first student, for example, you're probably familiar with for, uh, for kids moving to schools. Well, they also have first transit, which is for DD people and other sorts of things. So there can be a whole uh, constellation of how people get to a day program. Um, so that connects people to the day program. They're picked up in the afternoons, go back to their homes. That is the typical kind of menu for people. In this particular case, the state of California <clears throat> now has gotten to the point where there are some very difficult clients left to serve. Most of them have been institutionalized for many, many, many years, and in some cases probably unjustifiable in this day and age. So now there is new trailer bill language that demands that certain people be removed. You cannot, I can no longer put somebody in a developmental center in the state of California. It doesn't matter what their needs are. I cannot put them in a, regional, in a developmental center. It's very difficult. 
At the same time, they're trying to empty out the uh, developmental centers. If you may or may not remember, a number of years ago, uh, our particular agency was involved with the closure of Agnews State Developmental Center in Santa Clara. And so we built homes to actually do that. The state passed a bond issue, $80 million, for three regional centers to actually build homes. Uh, we were awarded 13 homes out of that. Since then, I've built 38 to be able to provide the kinds of means for these people to live a decent life and develop their potential. In all of this, we go through what we call a, an RFP process, request for proposal, for specific needs. So in about a year or two years ago, one of the requests for proposals was for a day program to serve people with very difficult behavior and, and a different constellation of needs because we have nothing like it and the state demands that we have provide for those services. This young man and his company actually won that award from a group of people. It's been this long to be able to develop that and uh, our program design, we developed the program design of what we needed. They bid on the project, they won the project. What will happen is that one by one, he will be given, and his wife in this case, will be given packages, referral packages from our social workers to take a look at clients and say, does this meet what our program can meet? And there's some people who won't, and there's some that it will. Will some have had a criminal background? Yes, some will. Have. We will recommend in some cases they do. They have the actual option of denying anybody we recommend to them. We can force as much as we can. But there are people who have criminal background in the sense that they have been arrested for some crime. You have everything from an East Palo Alto kid who was a gang banger, who developing disabled, goes with a gang, and guess who they stick with the dope, okay? We have all these kinds of things. There's, some, there's stories that will rip your heart out. Are there some that have been pickpocketed, stealing? Yes, there are. But part of our job is to, to provide a program that gives these young people an opportunity, or older people have been institutionalized, an opportunity to, for success in the community. And so I'll just leave it there, but that's the kind, just so you have an idea of how, you know, he's not operating on his own. He's not going out soliciting people. If the people he will have in his program come through the social workers in my organization, and that's a result of a very complex, very long, drawn-out process about defining needs. So if I could answer any questions about the system or how it works or whatever, I'd be glad to answer your questions. No nope. questions. Okay. Just thought the background. I mean, I have experience with GGRC and some of the clients he's talking about, and I can well some clients, not that he was necessarily talking about, but I'll address that in my okay. my comments. And if he wants to respond, he can. Okay. Then you may want to do that now before we. Well, I would just them. observe. I mean, I Public one care. one of the things I do is child welfare work, and from time to time we get um, kids who are um, developmentally disabled who are GGRC clients. I'm not suggest GGRC serves thousands of people, um, many of whom have no criminal history whatsoever. In fact, I, I would guess the vast majority have no criminal history whatsoever. Um, but from time to time, you do get um, kids like similar to the kid that he mentioned who may have been um, uh, someone who got drugs planted on him, but also kids who have uh, committed violent sexual assaults who have had, got, had been carrying guns. I'm not suggesting these are uh, a majority. In fact, I think they're a very, very, very small minority. But um, it would certainly concern me without knowing more about this program and how it's set up to meet the needs of kids like that in this area um, to approve a program that didn't have limitations um, on, the, on the population. I mean, I'll, I'd observe that now. And there are, there are ways that we could do that. I mean, we could uh, limit it um, both by time and offense. Um, as I mentioned before, um, uh, Penal Code Section 667.5 defines what a violent felony is, and it basically lists them all out. Um, we could limit it um, to say that they couldn't have had an arrest for a violent felony um, ever in the last 10 years, um, a charge um, or a conviction. I mean, we could do all of those things. Although ultimately, um, I mean, I, I might feel more comfortable if I had a better understanding, and I don't think we could have it today, of what, what safety precautions are in place with this program to ensure that if kids who, or young adults or adults who have that history are in their program, what security precautions are in place to protect the community. 
Um, and I just don't, I don't know, and I didn't think to ask in part because I read just like uh, Michael did, um, that it specifically said client does not have a history of criminal assault. Now, I'm not suggesting that that was an intentional error. In fact, I'm sure that it wasn't. Um, but it's a pretty significant game changer when you look at this application. You think, okay, these are just normal GGRC clients who I know, and most of them are not dangerous at all. Um, and in fact, it sounds like rather than what I had thought, which was this is just a day program for the developmentally disabled, this is actually a day program for the developmentally disabled who have the most severe behaviors that developmentally disabled have. They could have some of those behaviors duly diagnosed without criminal behavior could have medical issues, might have a G2. Uh, there could be a whole variety. I mean, the idea is to meet specialized needs on a one-to-one -one basis, but there could be somebody who, in fact, had been incarcerated. Not convicted, necessarily, because we have very few people convicted. They usually cannot, uh, not determined to be convicted. And especially if they come out of the juvenile system, um, specifically, mm -hmm. uh, if they don't have, uh, in, the, in, the, in the adult system, they have a developed system to return folks to competency um, if they've committed serious crimes, they can be placed um, uh, in, a, in a setting um, outside of the community, even if they haven't been convicted. But for young folks with developmental dis disabilities, if they've committed serious crime, there is no system in place. There's kind of a, a hole in the system uh, for uh, young perpetrators with developmental well, disabilities. Let me and just clarify one thing. Our clients are zero to three and 18 or 19 and above. In other words, okay. the school system is in charge of DD uh, children, uh, not ourselves. The educational system is responsible for the programs and the costs until they come back as young adults, either 18 or 22 if they finished high school. Well, you guys are also, I mean, when kids, so for example, a 16-year-old kid who should be served a by a school district, you, you don't serve them That's um, for their educational needs at all, but you start, still are involved. Very seldom. It's usually the education system is the whole thing. But this, but this center doesn't deal with any under 18. Yeah, that's one of the criteria. Clients. Right. There won't be anybody under age 18 in this program. Another question I had is, um, is there a program currently in Redwood City that is transferring to San Carlos, or is this a brand new program? It's a brand new program. Okay. Because in the staff introduction project description, it talks about Omalaga Incorporated is currently located in Redwood City and also provides on-site services at other locations throughout the Bay Area. So you have a residential programs there. And this is a new day, uh, day training um, program for San Carlos. OK. Any other questions for the applicant or Thank you. speaker? Thank you. OK. I guess I, I would wonder if the applicant would prefer if we were inclined to um, add a, uh, a restriction as far as the, the population, the acceptable population of the program, whether they would prefer to come back with more information about um, sort of the precautions they have in place and the security that they uh, have in place for meeting folks um, rather than having us place that restriction now. Okay. Could you, could you come up to the microphone? Things are being recorded, so. Again, thank you again for your consideration. Lorenzo Pendix will address that specific comment. 33 years, Alameda County Probation. He will be our program manager running this program, and uh, he can speak to the details of uh, any security issues or population concerns you may have. Can we just thank keep you. them both at the podium? What? Can we just keep them both at the podium right now? Or um, it, Sure, if you'd like. Would you, would you stay at? I, I think one of the commissioners would like both of you to be there. Thank you. Good evening. I'm sorry, what was the original question? Well, I, I, I was wondering because I, I think that, and I only speak for myself, I mean, I would be uncomfortable um, approving this right now um, without a significant um, restriction as far as the, the permissible client base. I might feel differently 
Um, if I had a better understanding of what um, security precautions you have in place. Um, but I, I don't think that um, you could answer my questions now in a way that would satisfy. I mean, I would actually need to see in writing um, what you would propose as far as, uh, and again, I'm just speaking for myself, what you would propose as far as how you are going to ensure that the community is safe um, before I was willing to, I was personally willing to approve this without um, a condition. And I guess I'm wondering for you whether would you prefer to come back with that information or would you prefer that, um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, because I can only speak for myself, that it be approved only with a condition. Um, and I'm thinking of a condition um, that the, uh, the individuals that your program serve not have an arrest for a violent felony uh, within the last 10 years. Well, I think that's something we'd have to, I think that's something we'd have to talk with Golden Gate Regional Center about because what we'd do is potentially could exclude one, maybe two people, we're not sure. As Chris articulately came up here to present to you guys and said, we don't know who will be serving. Uh, we, we are the program on the ground level, we get referrals. So today we don't know who will be in the program. And I think that sort of helps to clarify why I couldn't quite answer your question on who is in the program, because we don't know. So, you know, what, what I can tell you about what we're doing is, I want to talk about sort of the population. You know, the, the whole purpose of telling you guys what we do was to illuminate the larger mission and to tell you guys that we are in the business of giving second chance opportunities to individuals. Now these aren't hardened criminals we're, we're, we're discussing here. These are people with developmental disabilities, with lower functioning levels, and I can give you more details on people with developmental disabilities. I can give you a couple of examples of people in our program, but they wouldn't be the same people who are in here today. An individual who got arrested years ago and today he's 60 and he has nothing to do with his day he sits at home in his day and when he was a, a teenager he got arrested for a fight he was labeled forensically involved he's in our program hasn't ha hasn't done hadn't committed a violent act in 30 years these are some of the people we're dealing with so i think really the emphasis for the planning commission is people with developmental disabilities who have had an interaction with the criminal justice system folks who are not hardened criminals, folks who are not on active probation. Lorenzo Penix here is our program manager, on-site manager, 33 years Alameda County probation. And these folks are not even on active probation. So that tells, sends you a message on individuals who uh, are not being monitored. Except if they can't be convicted because they're incompetent to stand trial, of That's course they're not going to be on sure. probation because you're not on probation until you're convicted. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility. I just want to add that these individuals are in your communities now. Mm -hmm. They're in your communities. We're talking about bringing them to a site-based program, a contained program, where during the day, they're gonna be busy. They're gonna be supervised. We're gonna know where they are. From the time they get there, 9, 9.30 to 3.30. They're not gonna, it's not gonna be floating in and out, hanging out on the streets. You're either there or you're not there. It's, you're, you're in the program, they get credits or points for being there. They want to earn those points. And it's based on other programs that are in, exist in existence now. We have individuals that we work with that are currently going to other day programs. So we want to improve on what they're currently going to now. We want to make ours a better program. We can find some of the flaws in other people's programs to make ours better. What we ask our clients when they come back, what did you do today? What did you accomplish? What was the good, what was the bad? So we're learning from what they're doing now. So <clears throat> when we open our program and they're going to our program, we're already set for some improvements before we open based on what they're doing now. Our guys, again, he's talking about the guy, I think you're referring to Lloyd. Our toughest guy is 63 years old. And honestly speaking, he's been in prison in his lifetime 16 years. Lloyd, in his mind, still thinks he's tough, but Lloyd is tired. He's one of, my, one of our favorite clients. Saw him yesterday. He's been over now, but he still thinks he's tough. Really a nice guy. I don't know that Lloyd would be in the program, but Lloyd is probably our toughest guy. Lloyd's not tough anymore. But if you look at his jacket, 16 years, this is a bad guy. I think it was for arson. I think he, doing the, um, 
something to do with some rioting or something. He threw a cigarette into a police car, got convicted of arson. Well, and, and what Commissioner Silberman was mentioning before, I don't know if you're referring to somebody like this, who apparently this incarceration and conviction was 30 years ago, you said, something yeah, like that? the limitation that I was contemplating was within would, 10. Be, would be within 10 years. Um, so, so he wouldn't be a... And that list you're speaking of, 667.5, I think it is, I haven't looked at it in a while since I left probation. That's a lot of charges on there. Yes, there's a lot is. of charges. We don't have anybody that, that I'm aware of that's been convicted of murder. We, we don't have anybody like that. We don't or, have anyone. It's with, uh, murder, mayhem, rape, sodomy, oral op, uh, copulation, uh, a lewd and lavicious act, um, any felony punishable by death, um, any felony in which the defendant inflicts great bodily injury, robbery, arson, sexual penetration, attempted murder. Um, some code sec kidnapping, assault with intent to commit a specified felony, continuous sexual assault of a child, carjacking, rape, extortion, threats um, to victims or witnesses, uh, burglary of the first degree, and uh, a couple other um, specific sections. So I could be fairly certain that at least at a minimum the people in the building surrounding this location would probably be concerned enough if any of those, any people in your facility had been arrested or were found incompetent to stand trial for any of those crimes, uh, you know, adjacent to their place of work every day. Well, I can assure you this. There's a building down the street um, that has population that probably has that everyone, every charge on that list, I can assure you, I don't think the name of that agency, it's down the street on the left hand side. Peninsula Works. Peninsula Works. I passed there, and again, my background's in probation. I look at people probably different than most of you. I've seen a lot in the criminal justice system. I see people that I know have been on parole. I know people who are on parole, um, people who have been involved in the criminal justice system. I know the backgrounds, I see people in different places, again, that people, you would not know that, but they're going in and out of your buildings already. This agency he's speaking of is right down the street from our agency, uh, where we're trying to get uh, you know, this, this program. They're already in your community. Our program, again, let me, let me emphasize, I think I'm probably the most critical person of this program in terms of security. It's big in my mind, huge. We talk about it at our meetings. We talk about safety, safety, and safety. Even in our, um, our um, group home, I gave a speech the other night about safety, primarily for the females. When you leave at midnight, I want you escorted to your car by the male staff that's on duty. I'm on, I'm on top of safety all the time. Not so much for our guys, but for the community itself. There are people floating the streets that are not you know, not the best people. And so we have to be aware uh, all the time of safety. So this, this program would be no exception. Want to know where our people are. We count bodies all the time. Where are our people? Don't know that there will be 30 there at all times, but regardless of what the number is, we have to know where our people are and what they're doing. We're concerned about the neighbors, the image. That's big. So now I have a question what? going back to transporting people to and from, and you're giving everybody a SAMTRANS pass. And um, these individuals will be coming from the buses and walking through the community, and th that brings up an additional concern here. Um, whereas you say you, you're very tight on security on site, um, these individuals will not just be on site. Um, and so that, that just brings up a whole another concern. And, and just so part of the reason we're here asking for a conditional use permit in a, in a industrial zone is because we don't feel a program like this should be located in a, in a residential area. And so part of the reason we've been thinking, just, just to let you know some of our security thinking, and some of uh, dealing with some uh, a different population 
ha is happening in the planning stage of where something like this should be located in the community. And again, just to emphasize, we're talking about people with developmental disabilities or functioning individuals that are not a representation of the list that was detailed uh, a few minutes ago. Their there there subpopulation with special needs have 24-hour support by Golden Gate Regional Center. These folks are in 24-hour support residential settings and now looking for day programming settings. So that's all I'll say. I guess. So would you have an objection if we included that list? That's what I was going to say. <clears throat> I wouldn't have an objection with, and I, I guess we didn't expect to discuss programming, detailed programming at this at this meeting. This was, and so we'd have to sit back and talk with our partners. Does this still meet their requirements? Well, you see, the whole, the whole point is, is trying not to exclude certain individuals. That's the whole genesis of a program like this. So accepting an exclusion, not knowing who, who's coming down the pipe to serve is, is difficult. Are you referring to the 667.5 list? What yes. That, that's a lot of, that excludes, that ends up excluding some of the people that potentially be referred to us. Okay, so. It sounds like. It, yeah. yeah, it sounds like it may be in everyone's best interest yeah. if you go back and um, actually uh, try and answer some of these questions with staff and then come back to us. Hopefully we can do that relatively soon. The concern for us is entering into a long-term lease on the, the property without a conditional approval from the commission because our, these two processes are, you know, unfortunately working at parallel processes. We have a lease that goes hard and we're responsible for, for, for paying and uh, a lease. When is the date that you have to sign that lease? Uh, February 11th. Wow. Goodness. So we, don't, we don't have time. A week. Bring up a point because we are the sponsoring agency. It really it sounds as though there's a tremendous concern about this, and regardless of whatever work they would do in the time period allotted to be able to try to solidify that for you, it sounds like there are some real strong opinions about that. So if in fact the commission is adamant about having a provision such as he described, I think it would help everybody to know that tonight. If that is a key factor, because I as the sponsoring agency, I am already eaten up 18 months of the three years that I have to develop such a program. And so we need to have that kind of solid, you know, a solid response so that if, if in fact now we know that San Carlos is a city that we can't work with to have this kind of program, we need, it's, fa it's fair for you to do that. I, we just need to know that. Right. So well, I can't say that That's without fair. knowing more. Like, like I'm, and again, I can only speak for myself. If I knew more about the program and about the security and I had, I could not tell from this application that this is the, these are the type of services and this is the type of population you are going to be serving. Well, I, so I, I was surprised um, I when I heard that. the, I the conversation. You that some so. of those people would have been possible to have been in that program. Yeah, and so and that um, is the intention of the state of California is the intention of yeah. us as an agent of the state of California. So I can't say that I would be unwilling to ever approve a conditional use permit. Um, without that limitation until I understand more about the program. And I understand that, you know, you have a time limitation, but in all fairness, I mean, I, obviously we didn't create that. I mean, we didn't know. You, say you did, but, but yeah. I, if it's a concern and you have a consensus here tonight that we know that that is so important that that would be an addition to it, we'd like to know it just so that I can go back and present it to my board of directors and say this is the kind of issue we have that the program would be acceptable if we go back with a program modification or there's going to be this criteria that under whatever that provision is, that under no conditions whatsoever would those people be acceptable in a program. And, and just to add, you know, the, the basic level of security questions has been answered. Everybody would have a one to two supervision ratio and, and, and that has been outlined uh, for the planning commission. So you will have 15 people on site monitoring 30 individuals. A maximum of 30. Is it saying here somewhere that you're guaranteeing one to two? I, I mean, I do see that you yeah. say you're going to have a maximum of 30, and I do see that you're going to have 
um, as as many as 15 employees. But does it say somewhere that you're you have a maximum uh, a minimum uh, staff to uh, client ratio of one to two? I yes, it should. I'm that. sorry, I don't yeah. have the report in front of me, but it should. Yeah, that's our mandate from the state. Mm -hmm. And if I could just direct the Commission's attention to, um, it's included in your packet entitled as the draft conditional use permit. If you flip to the third page under condition number 11, it does talk about a maximum population of 45 persons, but it doesn't specify um, 30 students and 15 staff persons. But that's something that can, that can be included. We can modify this condition to reflect the ratio of students to staff. I thought that was in here. Right here. Yeah. From the Commission. Was any um, yeah, community no. outreach done at all by either the applicant or by the uh, by staff? I mean, yes, we did. The surrounding neighbors. What, what did you do? Ran out, talked to them, talked to them about what our program was, uh, who would who we would we would be serving and who we are what our background is the fact that we're bringing you know 40 years of criminal justice experience to, to the to the neighborhood and so we just spoke to our surrounding neighbors did i mean how how far did you go i mean did you was it was there a um i mean did you start out with a plan like i'm going to go within uh every every business within 500 or 750 feet no just surrounding neighbors um, on page five of their program design, it says there will be at least one staff to two consumer ratio unless otherwise specified in the consumer's IPP or needs and service plans. So they do actually mention that there oh, will see. be a one to two. It's in the middle under permanent and part-time employees. Mm -hmm. For the record, a 30-page program design was submitted uh, with, with plenty of detail. I'm not sure it, what got into the report, but that, that was submitted along with our discussions. Yeah. We got 13 pages. Um. Uh, 13 pages. Well, I've talked a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, anybody else have comments? Do you want to? Well, I think, I think similarly, with the big difference being that this will not serve that particular community. I was admittedly surprised about, about that and about the conversation. I'm also not necessarily inclined to, to deny a conditional use permit if I know a little bit more, um, because I think the work is important. Um, but you. I would like to know more. So what would be required to approve a conditional use permit? What additional pieces could we put in here um, that would allow, that, that would, would give the commissioners an added level of comfort? I think I would like to know more about um, similar on-site facilities uh, that, um, and I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm not sure which of you gentlemen spoke about other on-site facilities and learning from those on-site facilities to make this better. But I guess I'm more curious about um, being able to do a comparable in, in other communities and seeing what that, what that program looks like and, and um, what issues have come about right. from a similar program. I think, I, think it was my, I think I spoke about that. And there's several programs. I think PARCA is in your community uh, currently. They serve people with developmental disabilities. You know, I used to work in a regional center myself. The basic, the basic idea here is everybody's programming will be individually tailored. And so these, these are hard questions to, to answer because we don't know who we'll be serving. But the basic idea is to provide vocational and recreational opportunities to give people a structured environment for six hours of their day. Their day. Is there a sample individual, um, uh, like a sample individual plan that yes, can be Yes, which shared? was submitted. Um, oh, okay. We were, we're, we're happy to resubmit. If we get that. Um, would people be opposed to sort of a limitation on the number of individuals who might fit into that, that 
category. Um, uh, in other words, I'm trying to figure out the correct wording for this, but um, essentially the vast majority of the um, population that is served. I, I guess the concern that, that um, may not have been completely voiced is that this becomes sort of a dumping ground for the worst offenders, okay? And so how do we, how do we have a, a large dichotomy of, of individuals within um, this uh, group rather than getting the, the concern that we have, um, and I see the gentleman rising back there. Mm -hmm. can, can you begin to address that? All of these programs have to be audited by and licensed by the state of California out of the Department of uh, Social Services. So in addition to the regional center qualifying these people as a vendor, then you have the state licensing people coming down and making sure that they're meeting all their requirements, whether it be a staffing ratio of one to two, one to one, for the individuals pull the plans, look at that, make sure that the building's okay, the bathrooms are right. So every year you go through that, GGRC has its own QA section, which is quality assurance, making sure when the state's not there, that we drop in and make sure things are being taken care of as well. So there, the, 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 I guess the, the difficulty is for us is that there is no sample, okay? For instance, when we get criticized by people outside the system, they fail, and I don't mean that here tonight. I'm talking about even within the Department of Developmental Services. They like to use a concept called as average client costs, and I always go back to them and tell me, who is this average client? client yeah. we, have a, we have a device, uh, a medical, te I mean, a system called a CEDAR, and it lists what the conditions are. There's no two human beings that are the same, so I don't have an average client cost. So it's the same concept. We, you know, this program could go on for the next 20 years with 20 people max and never have one of those people in there. But we, I cannot stand here, and I don't believe they ever, we cannot guarantee that one of those people would not someday be referred into this program. We, we have our hands tied. It's the, regu it's the regulations of the state of California. And, and I, I think the, the, the concern is that all 20 of those, right. okay, I, could, certainly could, fall, that into that could fall into that category. That some, and but that's, if that's something that you feel comfortable doing, that would be great for us to know because maybe we could deal with that some way. I mean, if that was it, and we know that, you and, know, and that's, that's why I was, the criteria. I was I was offering that that and I'm you know that, where yeah. where I a mean, certain percentage could sure. be acceptable, but you know. Yeah, I mean, a, we'd have to look at that, and they, as business people, have to pencil that out and say, okay, you know, Chris, you've you've referenced your staff has referenced thirty people, and ten of them fit that category, and and twenty don't, and I can still make it work. Can you give me some? I tell you, the way the services are now, every spot when we develop something, whether it be a new home. A new day program it's filled immediately I mean I cannot tell you what it's like dealing with this population and the institutionalization effects and the young people coming up through the system and the new mandates to bring everybody who you've farmed out of state back into the state and to empty every institution it's very difficult task so I I can't see them not having 30 and so if that is in fact the comfort level for the conditional use I would suggest that a proposal be there to say okay 30 spots no more than X can be people that fit under whatever criteria you should so define. Then they can have the ability to evaluate that. They can bring back to us and say yes, no, okay, whatever it is. I mean, rather than you know pushing this off for two weeks, which causes even more chaos, and I'm not even sure, I mean, I, I, I know their staff. I wouldn't be here tonight if I didn't believe in their staff. But to put it on a piece of paper and write something, I don't think that's going to answer it either, to be quite honest with you. You can put locks on every. Well, actually, we can't. We got laws and certain things about delayed egress versus locked facilities. And that's what I'm trying to get at: is where is that middle ground where we have sounds an added like you've comfort got it, level? Sounds like you've come up. You with feel it. like there's there that, that you have that sense of yeah. of understanding where we are. So. I want to reiterate: we don't accept everybody that's referred to us in the first place. Before we can start the state for even in our supportive living services program, there are clients that have referred to us as just a little too far over. We don't accept those. We're concerned about, again, safety, community, um, and I'm part of that review team with every packet that we get. So, 
excuse me. So, so the way it's structured right now, the the clients flow through you to Mr. Omelaga, and does he have the? They come through my. Soul please, please back. come to the microphone so we can we can all hear you. As as the representative of the state of California, my team would get a recommendation from the the social worker, the family member, where the person is currently residing, whether it's an institution, in the community, they're having difficulties, the team gets together and makes a recommendation. And based upon that, we try to find a service provider who can meet those needs. Then we provide what they call a packet and send it to the service provider, or multiple service providers, who are, you, will your program meet these needs? Will you willing to accept this? They don't always accept the people. So, so Mr. Omelaga can say we will well, not say, accept I don't this want person. To, yes, and people do all the time, okay. which you can imagine. I've left with nothing but to put them in an institution. As of June 30th of last year, I can no longer put them in an institution. There are some people, and just so you understand, people that are very difficult who will never be deinstitutionalized, who will always be behind a fence. I mean, that's just the. Uh, I'm different in my organization. I don't believe that everybody can walk around. Uh, some of the, you know, the, the regional center system was developed in the late 60s where everybody thought everything was okay. I understand the need for institutionalization. The question is, you have to define what that needs very carefully because of civil liberties and because of sins that were in the past of just dumping people off. Okay, and so now we're looking to see when we can, if we can have a community-based program to enrich their lives. But every provider, whether it be residential, forget them, whether it be a residential, I develop a new residence, I provide the home and everything else. The provider who is in the home that I have developed through a nonprofit agency still says, I don't care. You know, this is the home you've provided for us to serve the clients. I don't want that client. They have that right. Well, and, and clearly, I don't think anyone's looking for a guarantee that nothing will ever happen. Um, clearly, you know, f everything in the news it's every day tells you that, yeah. wow, the, I, who would have ever thought? Sure. But, you know, we definitely would like to minimize any risk yeah. factor. You know, having a facility like this, you know, with just average run-of-the-mill you know, businesses surrounding it. What you do is if you have a proportion, whatever number you pick, and you could put in there that, you know, at front, if in fact this group ever wanted to increase that, that they come in front of you again. And then you have the ability over, let's say, and at the end of five years to say, we'd like to take serve six now instead of five. And you have the ability, it's a violation of the use that you go over five or three, whatever number you like, and give them the opportunity to prove themselves and then say, yeah, you've proven it. We're going to increase one if it ever got to that point. But I think that's that's much more workable. I'm sorry. That's much more workable than than I, I don't think they'll ever be able to satisfy it on paper. I, I just don't. I don't think that's realistic. But if you put <coughs> a condition in the conditional use, I think that makes a lot more sense. It's more predictability for everybody. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> may I um, add some staff comments to the conversation? Please. Uh, my, Thank you. My concern is that that this that staff wasn't necessarily aware of this at the time that this was um, presented and I'd like to hear yes that's correct um, <clears throat> what I've heard tonight is uh, information that is significantly different than what staff had evaluated in particular uh, the statement that the client does not have a history of criminal assault and the whole discussion that has followed um, brings to light a good deal of new information that staff did not have as part of the uh, application materials and did not take into account right. when staff made a recommendation to the City Council. So um, I Planning think that there's right. a couple of different, uh, well maybe one route that uh, I would recommend this evening and that would be that the Commission does not take an action on this item tonight. I think that um, from a staff perspective, uh, I can't stand by the recommendation uh, that staff has made because it was based on information that was either incorrect or insufficient. Um, and so we're going to have to go back and take a look at whatever the commission comes up with tonight based on the new in the information that we have on the table. So what I would suggest, and in, in, in listening to the conversation, the dialogue between the applicant and, and the commission is, if you do have some specific suggestions where you would like the applicant to go back and do some research or consider it 
for instance, the suggestion by uh, Commissioner Silberman, I think is probably something staff would want to take a very close look at. We'd want to have our police department and our city attorney take a look at that. And I think that from a staff perspective, that would be something that I would like to, you know, take a very close look at, very serious uh, uh, analysis of. So uh, <clears throat> while we routed this to our police department, um, they were under the impression um, based on this information here. Uh, and so I can't vouch for their review of this application anymore either. Uh, and so again, what I think would be a perhaps, um, while not, uh, 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 well, might be difficult for the applicant, would be for you to, um, again, make some suggestions about what you would want coming back if this application were to come back and then we could go back with the applicant and, and the applicant could go back or uh, to the board or whatever, look at that information and see if it's acceptable to their operation. But staff is gonna have to go back. Uh, I cannot stand by this recommendation. And again, I wouldn't recommend that the council take action on it this evening. Thank you. Okay. So where do we go from here? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm prepared to move that uh, that we table this. I mean, I'm not ex exactly sure how to how to phrase the motion, um, but I guess I move that we take no action. Um, we need to send them back with some information. Well, what yeah. I, I can only again speak for myself. What I want to know is because I and again, I'm not being critical of the submission, but when I there's a list of what the entrance criteria are. Um, which is basically supposed to be the client base. And again, I'm, I, I don't really know any other way to, to phrase it, but I don't trust this because it, it was inaccurate. Sure. Um, and so I want to know, what is the client base? Um, what limitations are there as far as the client base? Um, to the extent that you do have clients with a, a violent criminal history, what security do you have in place to protect the community, not just in the center, but how they're getting to the center, how they're leaving the center. Um, I mean, I want to. I would like to see um, if you are going to have folks with a violent criminal history. I would like to see some outreach to the community. Um, you know, some sort of notice within you know 500, 500 or a thousand feet, uh, so that the community knows when this comes, and hopefully you'll have some supporters. And if folks have concerns, that we can hear those concerns. I just feel like, um, and again, I'm not criticizing anybody, that this was just kind of a surprise. And this is a public meeting. It's supposed to give folks an opportunity to be heard about what they think about something. And I, since I didn't know um, what this was about, I don't see how the community could know what it's about. So um, with that, I mean, I, my motion is that we take no action on this item. And I believe the correct motion would be to table it to either a date certain or table it to a date uncertain. Um, so my motion is to table it to a date uncertain. Well, that let's ask oh, staff okay. if they feel there's a particular time frame that they could get that information or if it's better to do it to the date uncertain. Uh, yes, continue to a date uncertain would give us a bigger time frame to respond to the questions that you're going to pose to us tonight. Uh, okay. Staff reports for the next planning commission would be this Friday, basically. Okay. So your motion yeah, is Yeah, my motion is to table it to a date uncertain. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, um, reports, correspondence, and general information. Uh, report on recent city council actions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I guess I could um, report that the city council considered the final environmental impact report for the San Carlos Transit Village at their last city council meeting. And um, the council had three meetings. Uh, the first meeting was to hear from the experts. Second, uh, two meetings were really public hearings. Uh, they heard from the public at, uh, at both meetings. So they spent a considerable amount of time considering the Planning Commission's recommendation. They talked to all the experts. They heard from the community. 
and uh, they voted 3-2 to certify the environmental impact report. Um, so the next stage is to move on to the entitlement stage of the project. And we will be working with the, um, the applicant and uh, um, staff, and we will be putting a schedule together and looking at how to move this forward in the next six months or so. Um, and some of the timing is, um, is staff-based, some, some of the timing is applicant-based, and it, it just kind of depends on how um, the developer wishes to move forward. I think that a lot of, they've heard a lot. Um, the Greater East San Carlos neighborhood is, has noted in writing what their interests are specifically, and so uh, now it's time for the applicant to kind of go back and see what's going to work and what isn't. So with that, um, you would be the next um, formal review body to see uh, the entitlements. And um, I, while I can't give you an exact date, I would just uh, stay tuned. I'd say the next few months you'll start to, to see and hear things. Um, and, and with that, uh, that concludes uh, the staff remarks. So uh, you and I have talked a little bit about this, but um, one of the um, things that um, sort of was talked about throughout our process was the ability to um, add additional improvement measures in the time frame between the EIR approval and the um, project submission. And I think um, some of the planning commissioners um, felt that there would be an opportunity for us to have sort of a study session before the applicant came back with a project to actually be able to talk about some of our concerns about the entitlements outside of the EIR. Right. And so we talked about, we, we tried to stay on target for the EIR. Um, we weren't always successful. We tried to stay on target for the EIR. Now with the entitlements coming forward, um, is there an opportunity to have a agendaized um, uh, discussion about additional improvement measures, and that's a question. Sure. Um, I think there's an opportunity for a study session. Um, moving forward, it could be in a, in a perfect world what a developer would do is they would change the concept to conform to what the Planning Commission and the community had suggested. So. Um, we don't know, I haven't had those discussions with the developer yet, the applicant. Um, but in a perfect world, that that's would be what would happen. If that happened, um, your improvement measures before you saw that package um, may be totally different than after you see a new package with your improvement measures included in it additional changes to the to the project um, so it sort of remains to be seen what we come forward with I think there's a couple of different paths um, one path again the preferred path would be that hey they submit something that everybody likes right off the bat well but the developer you know could take a different uh, approach so there is an opportunity for a study session I'd say um, let's have some discussions offline with the developer and kind of see where things go. Um, it could be you see the same thing and you're back to where, you know, kind of back to where we were when the EIR was certified. So, um, I, and, and also I'd like to tell you that um, one of the things that I would like to do is I'd like to get the commissioners out uh, on a, a site visit uh, with staff, with their architect, with um, uh, Sam Trans, maybe people from the greater East San Carlos neighborhood, uh, and just walk 
up and down Old County Road and walk down up and down some of the streets with the plans. And I think um, um, I think that would be a really informative uh, thing to do. We would try and work it with your schedules. But uh, before you really get into shaping the project, I think that would be a, a, a very beneficial thing for everybody. So at some point, um, I think that staff will approach you with some dates and times to see if we can do something like that. That would be very helpful. Yes. Um, Planning Commission comments or reports? Nothing for me. I have nothing. I have two items I'd like to ask about. Um, the first one um, is the parking study. And that just came to mind again because I spent 20 minutes driving at least three blocks out from uh, the end of South Laurel looking for a parking spot the other day at 4 o'clock in the evening. So I was just kind of curious where we are with the parking study. Is that something that's coming back to us? Is that going directly to the city council? I know. Angela is supposed to be part of I that. I've not heard a thing. She's not heard a thing. Okay. But I'm anxious. Well, we we it. have we just got the initial data set from the consultant. So we just got it last week. Um, we're looking it over, and um, the next step we we also have a city council parking subcommittee. We'll probably meet with the parking subcommittee, and then we'll talk about. Um, stakeholder meetings. We'll talk about meetings with, um, you know, steering the steering group. Um, so that's going to be moving forward in the next couple of months, I would say. Okay. And the second item um, concerns the Caltrain electrification mm -hmm. EIR, which um, we just got a notification on that today. And do we? as a commission have any input on that is the city have input on that is it through the city council or and and what what are our responsibilities as planning commissioners with the electrification versus the transit village and that project moving forward and the EIR coming for the um, electrification well the San Carlos Transit Village and the electrification are two separate projects so uh, you should not um, as a as a commission consider those um, together the the CEQA document already did look at that um, but generally how this there's a um, number of different ways the city can approach it, but yes, the city of San Carlos has um, a right to comment on the EIR and should, I believe. Um, how the city will do that um, could take a number of different forms, and I think that's a conversation between uh, perhaps the city manager and the mayor at this point, uh, and I'm sure they'll be discussing it if they haven't already. Um, but um, sometimes a letter would come from staff it, or um, it would come from the mayor or somebody like that after a, a thorough examination of the environmental impact report, typically through staff, or, uh, and they might make recommendations to the commission or the council. Um, it really kind of depends on what the council wants to do and how they want um, uh, to address it. But it will be addressed. It's just sort of the process hasn't been worked out at this time. And uh, I'll let you know uh, as soon as I find something out in terms of what kind of a process the city will be uh, moving forward with. Thank you. And then we move on to correspondence. No correspondence. Um, planning staff comments, reports, updates of current projects. Um, good evening, Chair Marsters and 
Planning Commissioners. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm very excited to be here at the City of San Carlos and join the planning staff. And I look forward to getting to know you much more and to many more productive meetings. And tonight was um, a great introduction. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, let the commission know that as of right now, um, we don't foresee any projects coming forth for the next planning commission hearing, which I think is scheduled for actually on a Tuesday, which is February 19th, since Monday is President's Day. So as of right now, it looks like we may have no projects for your review at the next um, pl scheduled planning commission hearing. And I believe the one after that would be March, March 4th. And perhaps on, on the 4th, we might have... Um, most likely we'll have um, a project coming forward uh, for your review, which includes, um, it's essentially a two lot subdivision which would require a zoning ordinance amendment, um, two new homes to be built upon those um, proposed lots. And that's gonna um, be presented to the Residential Design Review Commission um, on February 19th. So you'll have the benefit of having their comments by the time you review the item. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. If nothing further, meeting adjourned. Holy moly.